Hey guys, Mel the Train Tutor back in the studio and back with another Talk Terrain video for you. Yes, where we look into in-depth design and the background topics that come with terrain making. And this Talk Terrain video is going to be talking about scale. It's one that I get off I get asked for quite a lot. And so I thought, let's sit down and do it properly. Yeah, and we'll really nail into it. Now, before you start, yeah, yes, I'm not wearing my normal terrain shooter top because we're in the middle of a heat wave here in this, and the studio is currently about 35 degrees. And also, yes, the colors you see in are correct. I've not messed up my white balance. Mel's arms and face really are that red, along with the rest of me, but you're not seeing that. Right, let's get cracked on. Let's talk about scales. So just give me a sec. Now, before we get into the actual scales that we use in modeling and wargaming, I want to talk about scaling in general. Now, I realize a lot of you will understand this, but I have a lot of younger viewers who may not have covered scaling in their educational process. So we need to do a bit of a comprehensive. If I'm teaching you to suck eggs on this one, apologies, we'll get onto the other stuff in about a couple of minutes, but let's talk about scaling first. So what is scaling? Scaling is the method by which we take things and we either increase them in size or decrease them in size, yet keep them in proportion. So if we see a big manor house, yeah, what we can do is we can measure all the features of the manor house, decide we're gonna reduce it down, okay, to a wargaming scale, and we can reduce all those measurements by the same scale and then perfectly reproduce that house on a small scale. Now you can scale down, you can also scale up. The majority of stuff in modeling is obviously scaling down, okay? Now, scaling is pretty represented with kind of a fraction, yeah? It's typically one, two, such and such. And my Wargaming uh, 28 mil, that's roughly one, two, 56 scale. So uh, 56 inches in the real world would be one inch on the tabletop once it's been scaled down, okay? Now, it's important to note that we use lots of different scales yeah, in model making, different scaling. There's a lot of different categories depending on what sort of war gaming you do. And we're gonna talk about those in a moment. But before we do, I want to sort of talk about the idea of absolute scale and abstract scale. Yeah, when abstract scale, a lot of the modelers are gonna be sitting up now going, abstract scale, abstract scale. <laughs> abstract scale, I'm, I'm, I'm scale. I'm not even gonna try and say that anymore, <laughs> yeah. They'll, you guys will be sitting up wondering, what the hell is he going on about? Okay, let me explain it. Now, an absolute scale is dead simple, yeah? You say one to 100. So, uh, every 100 meters in real life is a meter on the tabletop, on the, on the model. And that's an absolute scale, and it works really well, yeah? Especially in things like with the railroad modeling and the dioramas. This is because you are going for ultra realism, okay? And quite often, uh, railroad displays aren't really restricted in tabletop size. They, they can go on for quite long, which is why when you look at rail railroad settings, everything looks right and in scale, you know what I mean? And that's because they use absolute scale. Now in Wargaming, we have this weird situation that because we're using our models to play with, okay, and play games, we have something called an abstract scale. Okay, and what that means is, yeah, if you turn around and you say, right, let's say just for, for ease, okay, that we're playing one to 100, yeah, scale. Yeah, a little small. Yeah, what's that, 15 mil, I think? We'll get to that later. If you're playing that, then a one to one scale, one, sorry, a one to 100 scale, one inch on the tabletop is 100 inches in real life, okay? Now, quite often when we're wargaming, what we'll have situations is where we'll have troops with small arms, and yet we'll have artillery pieces and tanks with cannons on, you know what I mean? And if we were to use an absolute scale, yeah, then those cannons would be able to easily reach anything on the tabletop. To be truthful, because of the, the sort of parabolic nature of how artillery fires, the chances it are that if we use an absolute scale, 
the artillery wouldn't actually be able to fire at anything at the table unless it had a direct shot at it. That's because it would arch the the projectile too far, yeah, for it to ease uh, its short its range to even land on the tabletop. So we have this weird situation where we we have something called abstract scale. Now, and the idea of abstract scale is that one set of 12 inches, okay, is scaled down to represent a certain distance. And it could be the ra effective range of small arms fire. Yeah. Next set of 12 inches, okay, that's actually further than 24 inches in a scaling system. Now, I know this sounds crazy, but you get this basic curve where the further, the longer the measurement, the, the greater the scaling is. Yeah, and, and so if you think about it this way, with the railroad modelers and their absolute scale, they get everything on their layout. If you actually went and looked for wargaming, uh, let's say six foot table, which is what I've got here. Yeah, it is, if we play what I normally play, bolt action, yeah, that is one to 56 scale. So six foot times uh, 56, six foot times 50 is 300, times six is 36, 336, which is effectively, 336 foot, yeah, which is effectively 100 meters, okay? Now you think of a 100 meter track, okay, and actually think of that distance. In front of the stand when you watch the 100 meter sprints, if we were to represent on an absolute scale in wargaming, the chances are you wouldn't fit a single farm field on a six by four table. Yeah, but, I mean, could you fit a small hamlet in a hundred meters by, if that's four foot, it'll be two, two thirds of that. So a hundred meters by 66 meters. Could you sort of, and then think of that, and that's the, the situation with absolute scale. So we have to use an abstract scale where we scale things down in a weird, weird way. We scale distances, yeah? So for example, on a tabletop, yeah, in real life, if we were in, in abstract, in absolute scale, there's no way we could eat fit a village onto what you call it. Villages are longer than 100 meters long, yeah? There's no way we could fit a village onto a tabletop, yet when we war game, we have a village here, we'll have a small hamlet over here. We might even have a town, yeah, fit in, you know, with multiple buildings, all fitting within 100 meters, okay? And the reason for that is because we use this abstract scale. Now, the reason we use an abstract scale is because it gives us tactical choice in our games, okay? I.e., will the artillery be in range? Will small arms be in range? If, if we were using a, an absolute scale, then pretty much a pistol would be in range over a hundred meters. Do you know what I mean? And so that's the situation you've got with this weird absolute and abstract scale. And it can catch wargaming modelers out a bit because we think we've got to scale everything correctly. And you don't. A lot of wargaming buildings are vastly underscaled. Okay, they're a lot smaller than they should be for the scale. Yeah, because otherwise we wouldn't be able to fit them on our tabletops. The key thing and a quick tip about how to use abstract, abstract scaling. <laughs> it's gonna be the one for this show, this one, isn't it? Okay, when you do a building, okay, doesn't really matter if the building is in scale. All that really needs to be in scale are the windows and the doors. The things that we would relate to if a miniature was next to them. So the next time you look at a wargaming model, yeah, a kit from someone, have a look at it and have a look and think, okay, if that's 10 inches across, how big would that be? You know, in real life. Is that, you realize the buildings are actually quite small, but because the windows and the doors are the right scale, okay, when you put models next to them, they look right. And that's the trick, yeah, with abstract scaling. We can get away with abstract scaling, abstract scaling in our wargaming, but only, yeah, if when we're building buildings and stuff like that, the actual main features such as windows and doors and fireplaces, yeah, they actually fit the scale we're working at. The actual whole building, that can be shrunk down and people don't even notice. For exa example, yeah, most of foregrounds buildings, yeah, which I use tons of, massively scaled down. 
In fact, pretty much the entire industry's buildings are all scaled down. GW's old buildings, yeah, uh, the cardboard ones were scaled down, the plastic ones were scaled down, and I, I don't know about the, the what you call it, the their current kits because I haven't played with any of them. But I'm, I'm guessing they'll follow the same principle. So that's an important thing to understand from a wargaming point of view if you're making terrain for wargaming. We play around with the scales a bit, so you've got a bit of freedom. But if you are playing around with the scales, make sure that anything you reference a model next to, yeah? So if you expect a model to go through that door, it better be big enough for that model to go through that door. Otherwise, people aren't gonna see it as believable. And that's the difference between absolute scaling, which is used for the railway guys, it's used for the diorama guys and all that sort of stuff, and abstract scaling, which is used for the war gamers. And it is typical that I finally say it properly just as we finish explaining it. So that's the difference between absolute and abstract. Yeah, and, I hope now, and we now understand what scaling is, yeah? So what I want to do now is we're going to talk about a few common scales used in wargaming and diorama making and that sort of stuff. I want to explain the scaling system that's used, how we scale, okay? Because there's three different scaling systems that we can use. And then I want to talk about a few common things from a few different common scales that I work in, yeah? Just uh, little tips and stuff like that for if you're getting into that sort of stuff. So... See you in a flash. So now we've talked about the different types of scaling, I very quickly want to cover the different scaling classification systems. Now you see, it's not, within modeling, there's, there's three different systems we use, okay? So within general modeling, we have, yeah, what we consider traditional scaling. 1 to 10, 1 to 56, 1 to 300. And that's a, a scaling ratio that you can apply to absolutely everything. The measurements of a building, the width of a river, the height of a tree, the height of a man. Yeah, you can take that ratio, measure anything in the real world and scale it down for reproduction. Yeah, and that's, you know, that's traditional scaling, either displayed as a division or a fraction. Next up, okay, we've got scaling within the wargaming sphere. Now that's slightly different. In the wargaming sphere, we actually use a measurement. I often, uh, I play bolt action. Yeah, the, button, the, mid, the models in bolt action are what's called 28 mil. Yeah, 28 millimeter models, okay, and that's their scale. The reason being is in wargaming, what they do is they, the scale is based on the distance between the model's foot and its eye level. Now you may say, why eye level? Quite simple, we do military modeling. Some models have absolutely massive hats with plumage on, some have flat ones, some don't have hats, yeah? So the top of the model varies depending on what period you're playing, you know? And so you can't scale off the top of a helmet. So it's easier to pick eye level to scale to because if the eye levels are all right, it doesn't really matter what you put on top of their heads. Yeah, whether it's a centurion with a plume, whether it's a, uh, Spetsnaz or, you know, with a helmet, it doesn't really matter. As long as you the eyes, uh, the distance between the feet and the eyes are the same, all the models will be in scale. And so we have this millimetre measurement and it can cause some confusion if you're not used to wargaming. Yeah, because I get asked a lot, what do you, what, what scale do you work in? And I say 28 mil and it means nothing. Okay. And so that's what you call it. That's where in military model in wargaming, that's where our scales come from. And common scales in what you call it in wargaming, it's varied a bit. You've got sort of the six mil, fifteen mil, okay, and then you get up to this sort of twenty-eight mil, which also floats up to thirty-six mil in some cases. It's a bit weird. Wargaming's a bit like that, okay. But there is a third type of scaling system, and now this is the railway community. And they scale not based on a specific measurement of a height of a model, you know, from its foot to its eye or a divisional fraction. They actually scale using letters. And I think the letters have got something to do with the type of railway and the space between the tracks and this sort of thing. I'm not 100% sure it's not my field. And I'm sure I know there's a load of railway modelers who will happily be able to chip in down below. So if someone can give me a good example of that. I'll make sure I give it a nice heart and it'll float to the top of the comments for everyone. But they use a letter system. And depending on the letter, it corrugates it 
correlates over to a different sort of divisional or fractional scale like one to one six four. Okay, and yes, three different scaling systems, traditional uh, foot to high and then the letter system of the railway does make it a bit confusing when you're looking for supplies and for models trying to figure out because if you're looking in the railway world yeah they're using letters if you're looking in the diorama world they're using one to such and such and if you're looking in the wargaming world they're using uh, model height in millimeters yeah and it can get a little bit confusing to sort of track between the two i.e if i buy that railroad model uh n scale Will it fit in with this stuff I bought for 28 mil? Now there's a wonderful resource and I always recommend it. There's a website out there called theminiaturepages.com. It's a, it's a website time forgot, to be perfectly honest. It's like visiting the internet back in the 90s, but it's a wonderful resource uh, for information and that sort of stuff. And they've got a page purely about scales. And what they do is they, because it, it's a wargaming page, they, they do traditional scales. And on the opposite side of the table, they do the height in millimeter scale. So you can do that correlation and work out where things fit. But they also include the railroad scales in there, in the middle, in the description. So you can figure out where things are scaling wise. It's an absolutely wonderful resource. And if you work in a particular scale, I highly recommend you check the link in the description. I'll make sure it's in there and go and have a look at your scale and see what the related scales in the different fields are, okay? Bookmark it, save it. Whenever you're working in the future and you're trying to figure out if something you're gonna buy is gonna fit with something else, it's the perfect resource for you. But it's got all three of the scales on. So those are the scales. We've got traditional scaling, which is the one to whatever numbering system. We've got a height system for wargaming, which is foot to eye. And then we've got the railroad system, which is based on letters, which I'm assuming is something to do with the rails. But one of you guys will help me out on that one. I'm quite interested, actually. So. They're the classification systems for scaling. Next off, what I wanna do is, I wanna talk about common scaling for wargaming and that sort of stuff, and a little bit of information about the modeling side and what things I commonly do. So, just give me a flash. So now we've talked about the scaling systems, we're in a position where we can actually start talking about scales and when it comes to wargaming and modeling and that sort of stuff. So the battle plan is, let's start off with large scales. Now you'll have to excuse me, I've got a bit of a cheat sheet here. Yeah, there's a lot of numbers in this and you know Mel, I get my numbers all the way around, so I wanna make sure I'm right. And when I'm talking about large scale wargaming I'm, I'm, or large scale modeling or large scale, I'm quite, I'm sort of, we're sort of just leaving the wargaming category and, and the railroad category and we're dropping into what is essentially purely diorama making, i.e. these scales aren't really used for playing games and that sort of stuff. Well, there's a couple of exceptions. Okay, so large scale, what we're actually talking about here is anything that's larger scale than what we call 54 mil foot to head. Now 54 mil models are collector's models. They're often used in dioramas and that sort of stuff. And to be perfectly honest, we don't really war game with uh, 54 mil models. 54 mil models are a one to 30 ratio. Um, now I say we don't normally war game in it, yeah, unless you're Dave Marshall from TM Terrain and you're taking a table to salute. Have a look at these picks. That is a 54 mil wargaming board. <laughs> yeah, genuinely. It's quite impressive, isn't it? <laughs> right, but as I said, 54 mil, one to, uh, to 30 is the start of the larger ratios. Now, it's, it's important to point out here that it's just a tad larger scale than the railway modeling scale of I. 
okay? The railway modeling scale of I is one to 32, uh, 54 mil is one to 30. So it's quite close. So you can pull in I scale railway modeling items and pull them into a 50 mil, what you call it, diorama. The reason being is it's 50 mil foot to high to eye. But let's be honest, I know men who are five foot tall and I know men who are seven foot tall. So there's a bit of variation in human height. So you can get away with that sort of difference between the scales. So if you're working in 54 mil wargaming scale, you are fine grabbing the largest scale from railroad, which is eye scale stuff. If you're going any higher, large scale stuff goes up to, yeah, 179 mil which is about that big, which is a one in nine ratio. Now, I'll be honest with you, I've never done any 54 mil modeling stuff. I've never even gone any any bigger yet. Yeah, so with regards to tips and techniques, I can't really chip in. And to be perfectly honest, at those sort of scales, scale isn't really an issue. Do you know what I mean? You're not having to find the right materials to work with because you, the, the materials you've got are too thick for a wall and that sort of stuff. It's quite a sizable scale, so it's easy to work at. But with the large, uh, large scale uh, scales for the modeling side, after the 54 mil, which is one to 30, and the I scale, which is one to 32, it does go up and, uh, <clears throat> There's not much more I can tell you on that, guys, to be perfectly honest. Uh, right, tell you what, well, that's essentially large scale. It's not something I do a lot of. It's not something that I see much of outside the diorama work. And the only real tidbit of information I can give you is that idea that if you are working in 54 mil high scale railway stuff, you can grab for that. So let's talk about the more common scales for war game modeling, eh? Right, quick switch. So now we've talked about the larger diorama scales, let's have a quick chat about the common scales within wargaming and the common wargaming scales. Now you hear me a lot say, banging on about I play 28 mil, which is quite typical in wargaming, but there are a few different scales and I've played, I've played pretty much all of them now, obviously down to the notes. We start off with... The smallest sort of wargaming you commonly see is what we call more epic wargaming, which is designed for us to represent large armies on the battlefield. And that's round about six mil, yeah? That's from foot to eye of the model. So quite tiny, yeah? And that's a, a one to 268, yeah, scale. Moving on, yeah, then next up we've got 10 mil, which but it's quite common within historical wargaming, but hasn't really translated over to the futuristic or the fantasy sort of stuff and hasn't really rolled over into the main industry, but it is a scale that's out there. Yeah, and 10 mil is 1 to 161, 161. After that, the next scale up, which is quite a common one, is 15 mil. Yeah, and 15 mil is pretty much where you start to move from groups of units a whole unit on a base to individual models, okay? That's when we start to see individual models moving around on the battlefield on their own at 15 mil. Um, 15 mil is one to 107. Okay, then after that, we've got my favorite category, which is 28 mil, which is, I found out, one to 158. <laughs> Okay, and then after 28 mil, which is what I, most uh, common uh, skirmish war games are at, and the majority of the models are made for, you've got this weird sort of situation where you've got this sort of 32 to 36 mil. Yeah. Now the the reason for this is the there's two main reasons. One, the cottage industry nation nature of model making within the wargaming community. A lot of these, uh, a lot of the models that are made, there's no standardization, unlike in railways where you've got set scales and things are manufactured by different manufacturers to the, the exact same scale. So if you're an I scale modeler, anything you buy in I scale will be exactly the same. It doesn't work like that in wargaming because we've got lots of little companies and we've got no standardization. Their models vary slightly. So much so there's actually photos out there of like a, a range of 15 mil models from a, a wide range of manufacturers. And they're, what you call it, they're literally 
different heights when they should all be pretty much standardized. Now it isn't too much of a problem because of that human height thing. Okay, and Wargamers are quite forgiving with scale, especially with that abstract scale as well. We have to be forgiving with scale, to be truthful. Yeah, but it's what we've got to do to play our games. Yeah, so you'll have to forgive us. Now, just very to copy over onto the railroad guys, there's a couple of railroad scales. A lot of the railroad scales don't quite fit in with the Wargaming ones. They're sort of in between categories. Okay, but I do want to make you aware of a couple of scales. One is Z scale. Yeah, which is seven mil millimeters. So you could use Z scale scenery with your six mil armies, Z scale buildings and stuff like that, and they will work. Yeah. After that, you've got N scale, which is just a tiny fraction above 10 mil. So if you're doing 10 mil stuff, then uh, Z N scale will work perfectly. Okay, for getting stuff that's in scale. Now remember, with a lot of the railroad supplies, what you're looking at is hedges, trees, and stuff like that. So you've got a bit of variation there. And with that in mind, there's a couple of other railroad scales you need to be aware of, Wargamers. One is HO scale, yeah, which is 18.5. So in between the 15 and the 28, okay? If you go for HO scale trees, yeah, they'll be relatively smaller trees than you would expect trees to be, but trees can start this small up to under foot high. You know what I mean? So there's variation. So you can use HO scale trees. Yeah, you're just not going to be able to use them for really big trees. Double uh, O is 21.2 millimeters. Okay, so once again, not full scale, but you could use them. And O, the, the traditional O gauge, yeah, is 37 millimeters foot to high. So trees in O gauge will give you really big trees and that sort of stuff. It's a lot easier to use the more natural products from the railroad community and suppliers, yeah, when it comes to scaling, because obviously, all trees have different heights, so you can get away with that variation. The issue is buildings. When you're using buildings and you want to use them in Wargamer scales, hit the, the miniature pages below and make sure you've got a scale that is pretty damn close to the Wargaming scale. And if there isn't, don't buy the building. Now, to be truthful, at most of these sort of dimensions, at the 28 mil upwards, I tend to use materials that are about five mil thick. So when I'm using my foam board, uh, my bases are typically six mil MDF. I tend to use five mil EPVC as well when I'm doing buildings and stuff like that. Because it, it, around about 28 mil up, five mil is roughly the right thickness for a wall. Yeah, so when you've got a ruined building, if you put a model next to it, it looks roughly right, okay? When you're dropping, obviously when you're dropping down to six mil, a five mil wall, that's pretty much, you know, the height of a man, that's a five foot thick wall. Yeah, so you need to drop your materials down. At 15 mil, you wanna be looking at using three mil materials mainly. And then when you get down to the six mil, your walls, you really need to be looking at something like a mil plastic card, yeah, or two mil plastic card tops, yeah, for doing your walls. Now, it's not too much of a problem because at the lower scales, at the six mil scale, yeah, all your buildings tend to be solid pieces anyway, so you don't really need to worry about the thickness of a wall. But if you want to do some ruined stuff, if you want to do hedges and that sort of stuff, once you get down to thick, yeah, down to six mil, that sort of stuff, you want your substructures to be about a mil, two mil thick. Otherwise, they just don't look realistic. So, up at the 28 mil stage, you want to be using six, five, six mil materials. At the 15 mil, you want to be using like three mils. And once you drop down to about six mil, you're looking a mil, two mil top. So you're looking at cardboard and plastic card there, guys. Plastic card is great. A mil plastic card is, is pretty sturdy stuff. And you can do ruined buildings out of it and that sort of stuff quite easily you know you can glue them together and they, they they work but you do have these railway scales that you can grab trees and that sort of stuff from and throw those in as well and they're the most common sort of wargaming scales now i did say there's uh there's also another reason why up towards the top of the scaling system yeah the 28 mil and above it's a bit fuzzy yeah, and this is quite often in the fantasy and the sci-fi genres. And this is down to specifically one company, Games Workshop, okay? 
Now, Games Workshop, they have their own scale system and they've, they've over the years, they've slightly scaled up their models. So they started off at 28 mil, yeah, in line with what was out there when they started uh, sculpting metal models. God, when I was 12. <sighs> They were 28 mil when I, when I was 12, genuinely, yeah? But they've sort of grown, and I think they're around about 36 mil from foot to eye now, yeah? Because they've developed this heroic scale. And the heroic scale is quite strange because it's sort of one of these abstract scales where the bodies aren't in, in proportion, or more particularly, quite often the weapons and things like that aren't in proportion. The reason being is one heroic scale, you know, it, it looks nicer and bigger and bolder for, you know, the fancy stuff and the fantasy stuff, but also the weapons. You see, one of the biggest problems even at 28 mil with historical weapons is a barrel of a, of a gun is so thin that quite often they break very often. So what you get is this heroic system where they scale up the weaponry. Yeah, so it's less breakable because we play games with them. Yeah, so you, this is why you've got this weird scaling around that once you get past the 28 mil mark. Okay, it gets a bit fuzzy. Yeah, and another thing is it, it's, it's slightly capitalistic in the, in the nature that if you don't apply yourself to a specific scale and you create a scale of your own for your game systems, it's a lot harder for other manufacturers to make miniatures for your systems and pull them in. You know, they, you know, if they know they can only sell them for one system, yeah, that you know the GW upscale system, then it's limiting your customer base for you know alternative suppliers and that sort of stuff. So it's a bit cheeky along those lines, but wargaming's a bit like that. It's a bit fuzzy. But the important thing is to understand that when you do your modeling, one, your building materials should match your what you call it, your sort of scale. Yeah, so you need to look at what you're building out depending on what size you're working at. On top of that, yeah, when you're looking for scenic supplies and those sort of things, remember there are some railway scales that do fit rather well, and there's some ones that you can use as long as you understand that you can only use them for the natural products, things that grow at different heights, trees, grass, tufts, hedges, that sort of stuff. They're all variable, so you can have a play around with those. But if you have to buildings, check those scales and mainly go for Z scale for your six mil stuff and N scale for your 10 mil stuff. Now for all you 28 mil players, we're kind of screwed because uh, HO is 18 mil, double O is 21 mil and O is 37 mil. <laughs> which completely misses our wargaming scales can entirely for our larger models. So we have to stick with our own suppliers for buildings and stuff like that, such as the laser cutters, the casters, you know, Ainsty Castings, you know, and uh, Antonosity's Workshop and all the people who do the gribbly bits, you know, uh, Rizzle's Market and Annie does those now, doesn't she? Uh, Bad Squid Go Games. So... That's the general principle with the, the, the common wargaming scales. That's the sort of materials you're going to be wanting to look at. And they're the railroad scales you need to be looking at for your natural products and also your specific building types. Remember that rule about abstract scaling applies to all these scales. Yeah, just make sure whatever your model is going to stand next to that people would expect to be the same size, windows, doors. Yeah. That's right, barrels, the, all those sort of things. The actual scale of the building, you can drag that down quite drastically. Okay, so there's playroom in that to allow that abstract scale for our gaming setups. Okay, so that's abs that's the common war gaming scales with 28 mil and the fuzzy higher ones, 32 to 36, being the most common played in war gaming. But 15 mil is definitely in there, 10 mil's in there, and 6 mil is definitely in there. And then GW, I believe, have just brought out 8 mil, which is then playing around with the scales again. Yeah, but 8 mil will fit said scale pretty well as well, so go for that. <laughs> right, one last one. Let's, let's move on. Let's talk about the, the really small scale stuff, shall we? So, quick swish. Finally, let's talk about the really small scale wargaming stuff. Now, it's important to say that as we talk about these scales, 
we have moved out of the realms of the railway guys. Yeah, they have nothing in this scale. Yeah, so the I scales, the O scales, the HOs, all that sort of stuff, it just does not apply once we move into the really small scale stuff. Now, the really small scale stuff is designed to represent certain elements of wargaming, more strategic elements, yeah, which moves well beyond small units and individual characters and moves actually to entire vehicles and things like that. So, what do we mean by small scale wargaming? Well, it, Right at the smallest scale, yeah, you've got one to six thousand, which, <coughs> pardon me, is a quarter mil a quarter of a millimeter foot to eye, yeah, just approximately, slightly a little bit more, but yeah, a quarter of a millimeter foot to eye. So it's for for where you have like you know you'd have a piece like that, and you would have a battleship on that base. Okay, and your table would be laid out as a massive ocean and you would, you know, you'd have a carrier fleet and you'd be basically engaging in naval actions. And there's quite a few scales that are used for naval actions, yeah? And if you game in that area, you'll know the common scales. But obviously the important thing, it's only important when it comes down to the war gaming with regards to buying your models that you make sure you're buying them in all the same scale. When it comes to the terrain, you're making this stuff and you're not going to be looking at buying this small scale terrain. I can't think of any manufacturers that do one to six thousand scale scenery, to be perfectly honest. Yeah. I think that the smallest is about one to 300 I've, I've seen. So you're going to be making it anyway. So there is no pa comparable scales. Now that's the smallest scale, which is the one to 6,000 or a quarter of a millimeter. And that's used for naval engagements. Now, obviously there's lots of different scales for naval engagements, depending on how big you want your ships to be and how, how much of a land, uh, not land mass, but ocean you want your table to represent. As you slowly increase, the next thing you drop into is the aircraft scales. Now, they start to come in at 1 to 432 or 3.7 millimeters foot to eye. Okay, and that's where you start to get the, in, the planes in. So you're looking at, uh, right, Blood Red Skies and Wings of Glory are common uh, playing games. Yeah, you have fighter planes, Spitfires and stuff like that. And you move them around and they're about that big. Okay, the actual plane by the time, you know, you've got the model and that sort of stuff. Uh, once again, no specific... Uh, scenery for that but quite often airplane games aren't played on featured terrain tables we play them on more likely a battle map which is an aerial view of something okay uh, i'll throw a pick up and you'll get the idea now moving on from that you get to the first sort of what i would call ground combat okay now this is the sort of micro machine sort of combat area and it is one to 285 or 5.6 mil, it's just below that six mil stuff. And at this sort of stage, you're starting to get into armored units, you know, with individual models representing individual vehicles. Uh, I think what is, Challenger 2000 rules is one to 300, I think, which is just slightly, I think that's about four mil. Yeah, one to 300. And you can buy loads of little vehicles and you can literally have uh, battalion level actions on a tabletop. Now, as I said, there are no railway scales for this, so you can't go nicking railway scenery. Yeah, you're gonna have to make your own, but it is all small scale stuff. So you need to be looking at very thin bases because a lip on a base at this scale, it's quite possible if you use something like five mil as a base for a scenery piece, the chances are it's gonna be taller than your actual models, the lip is. Okay, so you really need to reduce your materials down. Once again, much like the six mil gaming, you're very, it's very rare you actually have to do inter have the internal structures of buildings available. They're normally solid blocks, so you just gotta get the rough scale right. And at these sort of scales, abstract, abstract scale sort of disappears because we have the room at these scales to represent what we need to represent to battle. 
you know what I mean? We have the range, we have, the buildings can be in scale because a manor house is still only about that big on the tabletop, you know, it's easily going to fit. It's only when we get up to the 28 mils and that sort of stuff that the abstract scaling really kicks in because we're struggling to fit the battlefield on the table, so we need to condense it using that abstract scaling which escalates, yeah, the sort of scaling over the distance measured. Okay, now, a well, quick note on that. Don't worry about it if you're new to wargaming. Yeah, most wargamers aren't even aware that's how it works. We just have simple rules. So it's not a problem. You're not going to have to be working out different scales and that sort of stuff. It doesn't work like that. It's just how it works for the mechanics of the games to work and us to be playable. But at these smaller scales, it's not an issue. We are very much switching over to the railway sort of system of exact scaling. Yeah. So... Naval, uh, one to 6,000 or quarter of a mil. Air starts around about one to 432 or 3.7 mil. And vehicles start round about one to 285 or 5.6 mil. Above all in these scales, you're gonna be making all your scenery. So it's all about making sure that your models that you're buying are all the right scale because at this scale of wargaming, you've moved away from the major manufacturers, okay? And you start getting to the, like, the small cottage ones, which quite a lot of them have their own scale. So double check the scales before you buy your models or only buy your models from one manufacturer and know your scales on this. But the chances are, if you're into small scale wargaming, you will know the scales just like I know the scales for normal size wargaming, okay? Uh, is there anything else that I need to add to that? What could I add to that? There isn't really much I can add to that, to be truthful. You know what I mean? You tend to find when you get to the small scale stuff, yeah, you, you, your scenic suppliers, yeah, will be supplying cast stuff, resin casts, okay, that you just paint up. So, you know, if you do need stuff, there are some supplies out for some of the larger side of the scales, but when you go into the naval, if you have to build in some stuff like that, you're probably gonna have to, what you call it, have to build them yourself. Unless someone out there does know of small scale scenic manufacturers that I'm not aware of. If so, in the comments, guys, please. Yeah, so that's about it. Uh, that I can think for small scales. It's relatively simple because to be truthful, when, when you drop down to the small scale stuff, yeah. Oh, one thing from terrain building point of view, when you do get to the ground units at that 5.6 mil sort of level, these models tend to have quite low center of gravities and quite wide bases re relative, okay? Which means that you can get away with quite nice undulating terrain and slopes and stuff like that. So st if you are making, you know, uh, a tabletop for ground combat, naval needs to be flat, yeah, with the occasional island and that sort of stuff. Air needs to be flat. Okay, ground combat can be a bit more undulating. You can have a bit of a play with that. It's one of the reasons I want to do some small scale modeling because the smaller the scale, what you tend to find is the lower the center of gravity, which means you can have more steeper hills and models will still stand and work on them and that sort of stuff. Rather than when you work in a, what you call it, 28 mil, where you need to work at roughly a slope of one in three. Otherwise, you're looking at a falling down situation with your models on it. You know, they're just too top heavy. So that pretty much wraps up everything that I can sort of give you on scaling. Now, if you've got any specific questions, as always, get them in the comments. Yeah, I always answer my questions. Helping you guys is what I'm here to do. If you've got any tips, anything you'd like to include, remember this is all about the whole community learning. So get those in the comments. I welcome those as well. And as always, like, Share if you know someone who's interested in this information. And if you really do like it, guys, remember there is Patreon. It is only a dollar a month. You guys all come together and you good ones who put your hand in your pocket for that dollar a month. Help make all this happen and help me share my, what I know with you guys. So if you really do like what I do, yeah, remember to check out the Patreon link. And if you're not into Patreon, you can check out what you're, there's a PayPal link for one off down below. It all goes on Studio Kit, including an air conditioning unit, which I think I'm gonna need pretty soon, otherwise my studio is gonna become unworkable. But I'll leave that in your hat, guys. If you appreciate what I do here, guys, it 
really does help and I do appreciate it. So with that and our absolute and abstract scaling, set it right. I'm gonna knock it on the head for this one because I've got palm trees to do. Uh, more terrain videos coming this week. Yeah, guys, you have got a Burma update, hopefully, and you've got uh, technical terrain videos coming. So there's plenty of stuff going on this week and coming in the upcoming weeks. So thanks for your support, guys. Thanks for making it to the end of the video. And you look after yourself. Have a great time. And I hope this video helps you with your hobby. All the best, yeah? Ta-da.